to Grace United. Remember, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. We're grateful to have Reverend David Heisinger leading our worship today. But first, a few announcements. While this is our first online service, the next will probably look different going forward. We've been told to stay in our homes, and we want to do what we can to help spread, help stop the spread of COVID-19. So our subsequent worship videos will be pieced together with a sermon from one home, music from another. They may not be perfect. They won't be perfect. But they will be a way for our Grace United family to feel connected to each other while we worship separately. As you all realize, things change daily. Grace notes will be sent each Friday with prayer requests and email updates during the week. Please find a way to share those with friends who aren't online. Give them a call. Make sure they're okay. The phones aren't working at church. We're trying to get them repaired. In the meantime, my contact information is at the bottom of each email I send. With God's help, we will continue to be a loving, caring family named for his grace. Would you please pray with me? Oh Lord, this promise from your word is a weekly encouragement to us. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. No doubt the first recipients of this promise would never have envisioned YouTube as a gathering place. Yet how different is the modern internet from the Roman catacombs? Neither is our preference, but neither inhibit your presence. For as one valiant believer has declared, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine! And so we proclaim with conviction today, we are gathered in your name, and you are with us. Amen and amen. scripture today is 1 Samuel 12, 20 through 25. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after useless things that cannot profit or save, for they are useless. So, for the Lord will not cast away his people for his name's sake, because it was pleased, it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. 
Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Our second reading is from Revelation 1, 17 through 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Please pray with me again. Holy Spirit, across satellites, servers, and screens, from the house of the Lord to the houses of your people, let these faltering words somehow bear your eternal word. From the highest heaven to the hungering hearts of the weak and weary, to the anxious, the isolated, the cooped up, the bored, reassure us, remind us, refresh us, revive us in the name of our all-powerful and ever-present Savior, Jesus Christ, who came, ascended, and is coming again. Amen. Do not be afraid. It's a phrase that occurs in the Bible between 85 and 100 times. The exact number depends on how you translate the Hebrew or the Greek. And I don't doubt that those four words are probably being preached 85, 100, maybe 1,000 times online this morning. I'm sure that my title is not very original on this Sunday. But... The widespread and oft-spoken command, do not be afraid, it's so hard to embrace, isn't it? Old Testament, New Testament, Father, Son, Spirit, all give voice to the resounding truth that the presence and love of God refuses to let fear abide. To Abraham, Hagar, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Gideon, Solomon, Elijah, Joseph, Mary, the disciples, Paul, to all these and so many more, the Lord repeated the same theme. Do not be afraid. So, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? It's kind of a stupid question. Seeing as I'm speaking to you on video amidst a societal quarantine and a firehouse, pardon me, fire hose of news media that we seem to check every 10 minutes or five or two. Of course, the coronavirus and all its implications are cause for fear. But I, I think this pandemic is, is equally a touchstone for all our fears. So I ask, of what are you afraid? A 15-year-old boy might say with bravado, nothing, except maybe asking the cute little redhead in study hall out for a date. But for the rest of us, I think we can provide probably many answers. Of course, there's 
public speaking and airplanes and cancer. I'm personally afraid of having more seizures. Some fear relationships, old ones, new ones, ones in danger of failing. Others would cite physical dangers, robbery or assault. Many are plagued by irrational but very real phobias. Others fear creditors and job loss, financial struggles of all sorts. Perhaps emotional or internal struggles like rejection, lack of control, being alone. The list could be much longer and you can personalize it with your own very significant, very legitimate fears. So considering such powerful, paralyzing anxieties, how can we not be afraid? Uh, author Hannah Hanard tells of a sermon she once heard about scarecrows. The preacher said this, A wise bird knows that a scarecrow is simply an advertisement. It announces that some very juicy and delicious fruit is to be had for the picking. There are scarecrows in all the best gardens. If I am wise, I too shall treat the scarecrow as though it were an invitation. Every giant in the way that makes me feel like a grasshopper is only a scarecrow beckoning me to God's richest blessings. The preacher concluded, Faith is a bird that loves to perch on scarecrows. It's an interesting perspective, isn't it? Smart birds know that a scarecrow is just a big old signpost for a tasty treat. Hold on to that thought as we turn to 1 Samuel 12, 20 through 25, the passage we read earlier. The context is this. Israel has demanded a king. They want to be like all the other nations. They've been uh, rejecting God's prophet and priest, Samuel. He's not sufficient. But Samuel has warned them repeatedly that, that their clamoring for a king is contrary to God's desire. Still, they persist. So God finally relents, and Saul is chosen. The deed is done, no turning back. Yet Samuel tries at least to prick their hearts and direct their highest allegiance to the Lord. He recounts to them the sordid history of their uh, rebellious and sinful ways. And finally, they listen and understand. This time, when confronted with their disobedience, they truly grasp the depth of their sin, and they quake with fear. They are petrified of God and the judgment their hard-heartedness deserves. A few moments ago, when I listed a, a variety of fears, the particular kind of fear that these Israelites were experiencing was not among them. We usually think of fears from without. Things done to us, things taken from us, experiences of people or circumstances that harm us. Seldom do we acknowledge what should be an even greater fear. The inclinations of our own hearts, my own desires, my own decisions, my own sin. Here's a, here's a gentle pastoral nudge to you. Allow these days right now of, of unprecedented fear, fear around us, to stir an unprecedented depth of Lenten contemplation within us. This is the foremost purpose the church has in, in uh, the season of Lent, is introspection, sober self-awareness, contemplation of our desperate need for the cross, because so often we turn aside from Jesus. So I ask you, are you as unsettled about the certainty of spiritual sickness as you are by the possibility 
a physical illness? Are your earnest prayers for protection from this coronavirus, are they equaled or even bested by your prayers for protection from temptation, from materialism, from lust, from self-centeredness? People of God, seekers of righteousness and loving kindness, let these days of palpable anxiety, of life upside down, let them do a marvelous Lenten work in you. Examine your heart and consider what you most fear. No mask that you wear can protect you from the truth. Cast aside any prideful assumptions of, of your own righteousness, your own strength and sufficiency. It's a little easier when we sense our desperate need as we do around us, is it not? Embrace your deep need for Jesus Christ's healing intervention. Verse 20 of our text confirms the scariness of the scarecrow. You have done all this evil. And that would be paralyzing, except look at the bumper crop that surrounds the scarecrow. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Folks, evil is always evil. The Israelite sin was not a good thing, nor is ours. Neither is the coronavirus pandemic, nor any other horrible fact of evil in this world. None of it that touches our lives is ever a good thing. Scarecrows are bad. However, do you believe that God plants some of the healthiest grains, the sweetest fruits, the tastiest vegetables, right beside those evil scarecrows? The Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. The mercies of the Lord are magnified when we admit how stubborn we are, when we consider how deeply we have wounded and rejected him. All of a sudden, the depth and height of his love bursts forth like the sun uh, streaming through the clouds. This is the Lenten calling for us to reckon our desperate need that the love of our resurrected Lord shines forth. To put it in the superlative, it is the cross, the biggest scarecrow of all that advertises our eternal sustenance. The cross marks for us where we find the bread of life. Or to put it in some up-to-the-minute vocabulary, you cannot social distance yourself from God. Six feet, six miles, six light years is insufficient. No quarantine, no lockdown, no hazmat suit will prevent God from reaching and redeeming you. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor coronavirus nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, COVID-19 doesn't stand a chance. Even more importantly, our stubborn hearts are no match for the grace 
of Christ. God's love wins against evil from within and evil from without. Given that ultimate truth, isn't this mandate a bit more reasonable? Do not. But suppose I were to look up and see a grand piano falling out of the sky. Wouldn't a healthy dose of fight or flight, a massive shot of adrenaline, uh, Usain Bolt sprint from the pulpit here, a fear of that falling Steinway, wouldn't that be uh, kind of smart? <laughs> Likewise, our scripture from Samuel uh, here reveals that there is a healthy kind of fear. Verse 20 says, do not be afraid. That is, don't be afraid of not measuring up. But just four verses later, we read, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Do not be afraid, but be sure to fear the Lord. It's obviously a different kind of fear, not a scared fear, so much as a, a healthy respect, a recognition of our own smallness, a rank humility and awareness of our waywardness, a reverent awe and a passionate desire to love the God who has loved us so much. An oft-used but well-suited illustration of this godly fear is uh, C.S. Lewis's description of Aslan, a Lion King long before Disney invented Simba. These words are taken from Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia when two girls, Susan and Lucy, are preparing to meet Aslan. Two animals, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, are advising the girls about an upcoming encounter with Aslan the Lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver, and make no mistake, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then isn't he safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver says to you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. Brothers and sisters, God is good. And not only all the time. He's good so much that he can say to you, to me, to all his wayward, chil wayward children, do not be afraid. I will not reject you. Fear me and serve me faithfully. But we can't stop there and miss the rest of the truth. Since God is good, ignoring him isn't safe, to use Mr. Beaver's word. Or as God says through Samuel in verse 25, if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. The rejection of God's commands by his people ultimately swept them away into exile at the hands of Babylon. And that's precisely where our ongoing series from Ezekiel takes place. We'll return to Ezekiel after Easter. But as you likely know, there, even in exile, God refuses to reject them. And so, do not fear. Finally, allow me to suggest that there is only one way to truly fear God, and thus not fear anything or anyone else, viruses included. It is by faith. A Johns Hopkins uh, study about worrying concluded this. We do not know why it is that worriers die sooner than non-worriers, but it is a fact. The 20th century theologian and missionary to India, E. Stanley Jones, 
however, had a convincing theory. I, who am simple of mind, think I know why worriers die sooner. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain cell and soul, for faith and not fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against reality. I am inwardly fashioned for faith, not fear. Fear is not my native land. Uh, faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are the sand in machi the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, by doubt or anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. These are not my native air. But in faith and confidence, I breathe freely. These are my native air. Grace United Sisters and Brothers, May faith in Christ Jesus be your native air as you pray to lay aside any fear of evil within or without. May you instead find joy in the fear of our good God who says and strengthens us, do not be afraid. No doubt if uh, we were gathered in the same location, gathered in this sanctuary, there would be uh, quite a few more of these prayer requests this morning. And so please know, you, even from a distance and even without these, uh, your requests on paper and specifically known and prayed for right now, that indeed the Lord hears these requests, knows the longings and the depth of your heart, and so even as we pray now, consider your own requests being lifted to the Lord. We, uh, as a church, are indeed uh, bearing one another's burdens and lifting each other's requests. Here are those that have been uh, submitted by email that we know of here uh, for this week. Please pray for Olivia and her family who live in Italy. Indeed, uh, quite an epicenter of uh, infection. Please pray for Elwyn and Elsie's family member. Oh, that is Olivia, pardon me. Um, please pray for Lisa, who has a chronic condition and is having trouble getting care for Lisa. For those awaiting test results, indeed, there are so many who uh, live in uncertainty as they uh, await these test results. In some ways that can be uh, more of an anxious place to simply not know than to, to have the at least awareness of what is the case. So for those awaiting test results and uh, for those who mourn, prayer for those who mourn so many uh, long before a virus has besieged us other griefs and losses have, uh, have affected us and, and 
deeply moved us. And so we pray for those even now as we also are conscious of, of many who uh, have succumbed to this sickness. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, what a comfort it is to come to you in prayer. We know that we serve a living God, the master healer and heavenly physician. We know that you are our good Father who longs to give good gifts to his children. We know that you are with us, that you know the depth of our heart, the experiences of our lives personally and intimately. And so we come with thanksgiving and with confidence. We don't speak into thin air we give voice to concerns that are heard by the living God. Please bring your Holy Spirit's peace and confidence to everyone listening to this, that they might know, that they might be assured that you are hearing their pleas as well. We lift specifically to you this morning, Olivia and her family. Nowhere on this earth is any more uh, dangerous, any more in or out of your will. All of it is yours, and yet we know from an earthly perspective that the numbers are intimidating. In Italy and in various other locations where we may have dear ones. And again, this side of glory, the risk is greater, and so it causes us greater concern, and we lift her and her family to you specifically. Elvin and Elsie too, as they no doubt have great concern. For Lisa, who is struggling with a chronic condition and needing care, struggling to get it. For her, we pray earnestly, as well as many others who, in the midst of this illness that is spreading so rapidly, those who might be more susceptible to it, those because of their age or, or health, have greater concern. Lord, we pray for your peace to be near. For those who simply await results, do not know whether their body indeed contains this virus. Lord, we, we pray that you would give them patience, that you would give the medical community so overworked, overburdened now, yet give them a productivity and a speed that is beyond what seems possible. Thank you for the many who do serve in that way and who are striving their best to help. And we pray also for those who grieve, some newly so because of this sickness, others long-standing wounds from losses uh, far in the past. You, O oh Lord, bless the, those who mourn. We claim that blessing now and pray that your presence would be manifest in a way that is felt deeply into the depth of our hearts, that by your word we might know you are with us. And because of that, we do not need to be afraid. Thank you for your great love for us. In your precious name we pray.
receive the benediction. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all, cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Usually I say go in peace. Today stay in peace. Amen. Amen.